Now the video series we're doing, these will be short and sweet, five or 10 minute videos where we look at very specific things in the Book of Mormon text and elucidate the text to help you see new insights and we give you challenges and assignments to get you into the text. So the, the critical point here is the intent is not for us to cover every chapter in the Come Follow Me curriculum. We're just gonna be picking little segments here and there throughout the year to, to focus your study in those little teeny areas and hopefully then you can expand that out into other areas from there. And we look forward to hearing from you comments, questions, and let us know what kind of things you're thinking about, what you wanna hear about, and we may be able to address those things in upcoming videos. Today, we're going to begin the first week of lessons in the first book of Nephi. But rather than trying to cover a whole bunch of things from chapter one through seven, we're just gonna focus on chapter one. I'm gonna begin by focusing on the very first verse of the first chapter of this great Book of Mormon. It is such a widely read verse, very commonly covered by people as they begin anew to read the Book of Mormon, that if you ask most people to start reciting 1 Nephi chapter 1 verse 1, they're all going to do pretty well and they're usually going to say, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, and then it drops off from there. The ironic thing about this verse is it is, in my opinion, it is the best opener to any book that I've ever read for me personally. It, this, this is the greatest prologue ever because in one verse Nephi has managed to be able to encapsulate in a nutshell the entire Book of Mormon, our entire story, everybody's story. It's, it's beautiful how he does this and it's accomplished with three phrases. And those phrases are connected with some critical words. The first word is therefore. In English, therefore serves a very, very simple function grammatically. It connects two phrases. Phrase A, therefore. Phrase B becomes a cause and effect. Quite simply, because of A, B happens. So if you take a second and push pause on the video, look at verse 1 and find the, the first therefore, look for phrase A, then look for phrase B, and analyze for a minute what is the cause and what is the effect. Okay, now, what did you notice? Because he was born of goodly parents, the outcome was, look carefully at all these words, therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father. You'll notice that uh, Nephi didn't learn everything about everything that his dad knew. He was taught somewhat in all of the learning of my father. So dad gave me this, this broad exposure to what he knows, but any, any parent who knows what they're doing realizes you can't teach everything. Experience is going to be the, the master teacher here, and this is a beautiful introduction. Everybody's story begins with a family. There's a creation, and uh, chapter 1, verse 1 begins with a creation. We know that following a creation, there's usually a fall. Well, the next phrase is encapsulated in a nevertheless clause. Nevertheless forms a very interesting grammatical connection between we'll call phrase C and phrase D. You'll notice it's, it's a simple made-up word, uh, nevertheless, could have just as easily been always the greater, but this is simpler. Nevertheless, a sim there are a couple of simple ways to look at this. You could put a uh, less than sign. C is always going to be less than D because D is nevertheless. It's always the greater. You always put the greatest emphasis over here on what follows. So it's as if this were a cause 
but over here it's not an effect, it's actually a counter effect. It's not what you would have seen coming. It's not what you would normally anticipate. The greatest nevertheless moment, in my opinion, of all time is when the Savior walks into Gethsemane and he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee, remove this cup from me. I don't want to do this anymore. But you'll notice that is going to get less emphasis and never the less emphasis, always the greater emphasis is going to go on what follows. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done, or not what I will but what thou wilt. It's not the outcome you would have anticipated based on that, uh, the cause that leads into it. Pause the video and identify the nevertheless phrase, look for the cause, look for the counter effect, and realize he wants you to recognize that's what he's facing, minimize it, and maximize this. What do you notice? Hopefully you notice that uh, Nephi's life hasn't been easy, and by the way, according to 2 Nephi chapter 5, he's writing this book, 1 Nephi, on the small plates between 30 and 40 years after they've left Jerusalem. So it's been a long time, and now thinking back through the history, it has a little more context when Nephi says, having seen many afflictions in the course of my days. We could start listing what those, uh, many of those afflictions are. But he doesn't want you focusing on how hard his life has been. He wants the greater emphasis, never the less emphasis, to be on having been highly favored of the Lord. I don't know if Nephi could have said that if his life had been a smooth sidewalk with a guardrail with flowers and calm weather the whole time. I think he comes to know how good God is and, and how highly favored he is through a very, very stormy life and very uh, difficult journeys through the wilderness and with his familial relationships. So we had a creation with a family, with parents, being taught, then having that agency, and then you get this, this fall, this, this difficult, uh, mortal struggle, and then there's always going to be atonement. The, the last phrase is once again a therefore phrase. It's a phrase A and a phrase B, so pause the video and look for the therefore and identify what causes what to finish verse 1. Okay, you'll notice that he takes his counter effect from his second phrase, having been highly favored of the Lord, which then feeds in directly into the final phrase A, which is having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God. Because I know how good God is and how kind he's been to me, because of that, I'm going to make a record of my proceedings in my days. I don't want to be the only one who knows how good God is. I want everyone to know this. I want, I want everybody to see the hand of God in my life, and if they can see it in my life, hopefully they'll be able to see it in their own. So, as you embark on your journey into the Book of Mormon, don't forget to make this your own story. One of, the, uh, one of the exciting things about this book is its capacity to not just teach you history, but to teach you your story, your story, if you will. And you can own this. You can, you can find yourself, you can find the Lord on every page of this book. Some people would ask, what's the, what's the best part of the book? What is the most amazing part of this book? And my answer would be whichever page you're reading right now. That's how good this book is. So as you're reading and as you're studying this entire book, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, pay attention to words that sometimes get totally skipped over and watch what happens to your capacity to dive a little deeper into your study of this incredible book and see the hand of God, not just in their life, but then in your own as well.